Can you guys hear me? Is this working? Yes, A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So I noticed some people checking out their cell phones or falling asleep, and I want to hope that you guys are going to wake up a little bit to hear what I have to say, because I'm actually going to leave room for Q&A. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a, a dialogue towards the end of this. Uh, first, um, I just want to say how great it is to be here. Um, I actually live in Washington, D.C. in real life, but I just bought a home in Austin, so I'm now going to be living in Austin half time. And, uh, and so I feel like now that I'm a Texan, I don't know if I'm allowed to say I'm a Texan yet, but, uh, <laughs> but now that I live in Texas, I feel like it's my moral obligation to help with the laws here too. So uh, part of this presentation gives a little taste of what I think we can do to move forward in Texas. So, uh, you know, I know Jim said he, he uh, swore that marijuana was going to be legal by 2017. Uh, I originally had that also as the same year, but the deeper that I got into the plan, I realized that it might need to be 2019, and you'll see why in, uh, in one of these slides that I have to present. So in terms of what we do to change laws nationwide, we kind of have it in a few different buckets. So one bucket is, uh, of course, medical marijuana. Uh, and I think we have a real shot at moving forward with, uh, with passing more of those laws, which I'll show you in a map uh, in a moment. Uh, then there's the decrim bucket, which means removing the, uh, the threat of jail for people who are busted with up to one ounce of marijuana. Uh, three is legalization. Four is Congress, even though we're not going to pass anything in Congress anytime soon. Uh, there still is a lot of progress that can be made in Congress. And then fifth is, let's, let's do something in Texas. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, in terms of where we are with medical marijuana nationwide, uh, as you know, it's legal in 18 states plus DC. Uh, we just passed our medical marijuana bills in Illinois. Thank you. I was, I was thinking also. I want one of them. <laughs> How are we doing now? <laughs> okay. Uh, you might have heard that we just, I think Russ might have mentioned it, but uh, we just passed our medical marijuana bills in uh, Illinois and in New Hampshire. Uh, the governor of Illinois is thinking about it. The governor of New Hampshire is 99% certain to, to sign the bill. And if they both sign, that means that medical marijuana will be uh, legalized in both Illinois and in New Hampshire sometime in the next couple of weeks. So that's... <laughs> so it seems like we probably now finally have the votes in New York State. The governor is a little squishy but I would say New York is probably going to be the next state after the Illinois and New Hampshire. And then Minnesota, I think we're going to win there by about 2015. So decrim, uh, there's 15 states that have decrim laws. The best of those laws are in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Vermont. You might have heard that at the ver as this conference was beginning, the governor of Vermont signed our decrim bill. So as a result of a few years of lobbying, uh, people in Vermont who are caught with up to one ounce will no longer face jail time. When we talk about decrim, we want to always be thinking about the Massachusetts law. That's the perfect decrim law, we, uh, because it was a ballot initiative. We were able to draft it, uh, and so we just made it perfect. So decrim in Massachusetts is, in addition to no arrest and no jail, it also means that you can't have your kids taken away, uh, that you uh, will not be stripped of the ability to be a foster parent, you will not have your guns taken away, you will not have your driver's license taken away, you will not have your professional license to practice law or medicine taken away. You will not lose your welfare benefits, et cetera. So there's 11 or 12 things we put in there. So Massachusetts is the perfect decrim law. No matter how many times you're caught with marijuana, you get a $100 ticket. There's no criminal record. There's no database. It's $100 every single time you get busted. And there's no age limit on that either. So it's $100 regardless of age. We don't discriminate against young people. So that is the law that we want to promote in in Texas. So when we talk about the Dutton bill, the Dutton bill has gotten so watered down. It's the bill that some of us testified in favor of in March, including me. It's so watered down now that we have to start from scratch. So what we'd like to do is talk to Representative Dutton, 
who really does believe in the cause and just encourage him to make the bill good again. Um, so in addition to decrim being on the books in 15 states, there's also Colorado and Washington where there's no penalty at all. So it's really 15 plus two states where there's no threat of jail for, for possession. And my prediction on the next states would be Hawaii, Maryland, <coughs> and DC. So you'll see one of the nice things about this job when things are going well is that my slides get outdated really fast. So the black states are the decrim states, the blue are our two favorite states. And uh, you see in uh, the red in Vermont, so that just turned black, so that's good news. And then the next states for decrim are the red ones, so Hawaii, Maryland, and DC. So legalization is the, the next thing that we work on nationally. Uh, legalization is, of course, you can make up any definition you want, right? You can say legalization means you grow marijuana like tomatoes. That's fine if you want to call it that. When we talk about legalization when we're drafting legislation, we talk about this. So people uh, get to uh, possess up to a certain amount of marijuana. They get to grow up to a certain amount of marijuana at home with no license. Uh, the state government issues licenses to wholesalers and retailers and kitchens and testing facilities. And then, of course, DUI and selling marijuana to kids is, would remain illegal. So when we talk about legalization, we, we think of the alcohol model. Uh, it's, it's legal to brew beer at home up to a certain point without a license. It should be legal to grow marijuana at home up to a certain point without a license. So that's what we mean by legalization. That's shorthand for this presentation. And it happens to be the law in Colorado, which we passed in November. Uh, one of the things that led us to victory Sorry, we'll talk about this one first. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the, the plan for how legalization is going to move forward across the country. Uh, the, as I said, the two blue states are our two favorite states. Um, the green ones are where we're making progress through the legislatures. So Rhode Island, we already have half of the state house in Rhode Island that's co-sponsored the legalization bill. And I predict that Rhode Island will be the first state to legalize through the state legislature. Uh, Vermont, we're now moving forward now that decrim is taken care of, so Vermont is now uh, a focus for us on full legalization. Uh, New Hampshire, they've already been voting on legalization every year or two, and that will continue to proceed. Maryland, there's going to be a major push for legalization uh, coming up when the legislature reconvenes in January. And then Hawaii, uh, we were surprised actually, pleasantly so, that the, uh, the Speaker of the House of Hawaii actually introduced a legalization bill. So when you have the top House Democrat in Hawaii who's the lead sponsor of legalization, that should give you room for encouragement. So that's where we are with the state legislatures. And then uh, the orange state is the next state that's going to vote on legalization through a ballot initiative. We're going to put a legalization question on the ballot in Alaska in August of next year. So what, 14 months from now, Alaska will be voting on uh, the legalization initiative. And then the red states are those where we were predicting that uh, these questions would be on the ballot all on the same day in November of 2016. We're not trying to do a big splash in one day just to be sexy in the media. The reason that we choose November 2016 is that marijuana initiatives do better in presidential elections than in non-presidential elections. And that's because there are a lot of young people who are too lazy to vote every election, but they'll at least vote once every four years. So we'd like to capitalize on that push of young people voting in presidential elections and piggyback with marijuana initiatives. So uh, we did so well in, in Washington and Colorado because it was a presidential election that we want to reproduce that model. So there are seven states that are going to be voting on legalization all on the same day in 2016. So those are the red ones. Although Oregon you know, might jump out in front and do 2014, which is risky. It's possible it'll pass, and I hope it does if, if it's on the ballot but it's easier to pass in 2016. It's also cheaper to pass in 2016. Um, one of the things we did to instigate public debate in Colorado is we wanted people to be uh, talking about unlikely suspects who, would, who were supporting legalization. Uh, Pat Robertson was just one of many. <laughs> Cheyenne's looking at me. <laughs> I swear, Cheyenne, I actually had this slide uh, pre-existent before we had dinner last night. Um, so, uh, Pat Robertson is one person that we uh, used as part of the uh, debate in Colorado, but there are other billboards that we run in states that we care about to get the public talking 
about legalization in ways that they haven't already been talking about. Uh, in Congress, uh, this is not going to, this stuff's not going to pass, but this is the stuff where, you know, that's in play. So we have states' rights for all marijuana with no tax. That's the Dana Rohrabacher bill. And then you have a pair of bills to treat marijuana like alcohol. And that's Blumenauer and Paulus. States' rights for medical marijuana is Blumenauer. A pair of marijuana industry bills to fix the banking and the tax problems. So if any of you guys are in the, the industry, which I doubt many people are since you live in Texas, um, there, there's two bills to fix the industry problems that you might have heard about in Colorado and California, places like that. And then we were thinking we are going to have a vote on an amendment in Congress this summer, but it looks like it's not going to happen. So we're going to push for the summer of 2014. That amendment, by the way, would be a state's rights amendment. It would say if a state has marijuana legal, then the feds should butt out. So we'll, we'll get about 100 votes, I think, and therefore it would fail because you need about 218 votes to pass in the House. So in terms of Texas, in terms of the conversations that I've had with people at this conference, I talked to the Texas for Compassionate Care and Libertarian Party and obviously lots of folks, different normal chapters, um, got a sense that it seems like it's fair to put legislation in Texas into three similar buckets that we do elsewhere. So a medical marijuana bill, uh, when I say medical marijuana, I do not mean the lame bill that Elliot uh, Neshtak uh, introduces every two years. That's not a, a actually a good bill. Uh, we'd like to get a real medical marijuana bill introduced in Austin, and that would be a muscular bill that actually provides patients with protection from arrest, allows patients to grow their own, and allows patients to buy from a store, and caregivers could also help. So we want a muscular medical marijuana bill introduced, and I think we can um, if we all work together on it. A muscular decrim bill, which is not the current bill that we testified in front of, uh, before uh, the legislature in March, but rather a decrim bill that looks something like Massachusetts, where it actually really does protect you from arrest and jail and a whole host of collateral sanctions, like losing your children and guns and so forth. And then uh, a muscular legalization bill. I've heard uh, word that there's a couple of Republicans who are thinking about introducing legalization in the Texas House. And if they do, and I would strongly encourage that to happen, we'd want that bill to look like the Colorado law. Start with a really good one, and if you have to water it down later, that's fine, but let's start with something really, really good. So how, how do we actually pass bills in state legislatures, and how would we work with you all in, in the Texas uh, legislature if we were to get involved uh, in a more serious way here? So what we've done to pass our bills in, you know, Illinois and, and Vermont and Rhode Island and Delaware and these other states is that we have staff attorneys who help draft the bills, they draft amendments, they fly and testify, they organize other people to testify, they train people to testify, uh, they answer the media's questions. So we have a team of staff attorneys who, you know, quote unquote quarterback the situation in each state. And then, of course, if you really are serious about passing a bill in a state capital, you probably need to actually have a lobbying firm that's in that state capital where the lobbyists already have relationships with the legislators. And these lobbyists are paid to have friendships with legislators. So they go and they play golf with them. They go to their children's birthday parties. They give them money. So lobbyists do all this all year round to build warm, loving relationships with legislators. And then we pay to tap into those warm, loving relationships. It costs about $50,000 per year per state to play, and uh, it's a formula that's been working elsewhere, and I intend to raise money so we can have a lobbying firm do the same in Austin. Uh, and then we also uh, engage in pressure tactics for legislators who are on the fence, which means paying for patients or other key people to travel to the state capitol if they can't afford to do so on their own. Uh, sometimes it costs money to generate waves of phone calls from constituents to their legislators. Sometimes you can actually do that by placing ads uh, on Facebook to generate constituent emails to legislators and so forth. Radio ads also help. All this stuff costs money. It's just a question of knowing when and where to run this stuff. Uh, so, you know, if we do get more involved in Texas, which will take, you know, a lot more uh, of a conversation with some of the people in this room and some people who have already left, uh, if we all decide that we like the plan of going for two or three bills and we all kind of agree on what the bills should look like, 
then what I would try to do is help raise money to pay for some of the key things, a lobbying firm and some other ancillary expenses. Um, I'm not going to serve as a lobbyist in Austin, even though I'm going to live seven, I am living seven blocks from the state capitol. I'm actually going to just use uh, my knowledge that I'm attaining in Texas to try to raise money for the cause here, and I'll occasionally hang out in the state capitol, but I think it's better to actually have like a real lobbyist doing the lobbying and coordinating with people all around the state to make sure that everyone knows what legislators are the most important to talk to. So, you know, I have to say I'm really impressed with the folks I've met here. Uh, I go to conferences all around the country, and uh, I, I have to say this is one of the best regional conferences I've ever been to. It might even be the best. <laughs> and the reason I say that is that, you know, sometimes when you go to conferences in California, um, you know, people are sort of just, they have a sense of entitlement in California. They think, well, we've been at this for so long, we know what to do, and we can get stoned constantly and not even listen to you, and I'll interrupt you whenever I want. So that's the kind of the attitude that I get from people in San Francisco and some other uh, cities where I've spoken where uh, I think the folks aren't necessarily as serious about change because they think they already have it pretty, pretty well off. Whereas I find that the folks that I've met here are deadly serious about change because the laws in Texas are terrible and we need to do something about it and it doesn't work by not listening to each other, it works by you know, uh, listening and taking notes and asking good questions and then being uh, friendly with each other afterwards. And I've gotten that sense here in a way that I do not get in California. So uh, applause to you for being as committed as you are to move this stuff forward. Um, it looks like my timer says I actually have 14 minutes left for Q&A if you guys have any questions. And while you're thinking about that, if you haven't already signed up for our email list, I'm going to pass these two clipboards around so you can sign up and you'll get our legislative updates for Texas and or national, which means you'll get about three updates a month. So if you can handle three updates a month, <laughs> please sign up and if not, please just pass it along. So who wants to ask the first question? Over. Let's start at this table. <laughs> the strategy, <clears throat> the question is uh, what can we do to change federal law since I just did a lot of talking about state stuff. The answer is First of all, 99% of all marijuana arrests are made under state law. So if you actually change a state law, you're getting rid of about 99% of the problem. So there's obviously immediate benefit to changing state laws, even if the federal law is still bad. But the strategy is that we believe we need to change more state laws before we can even hope to change federal law. I predict that we'll change more state laws, and then the federal law will change, and then the remaining states will say, well, heck, now that the feds have changed, now I guess we can change. So I think it'll be states, federal, states. And if you're afraid of federal law, then uh, just don't get involved in the marijuana industry. Uh, if, you're, if we change the law in Texas, for example, to decriminalize possession or to legalize medical marijuana or to legalize marijuana entirely for all adults, if we succeed at that and you're nervous about feds, then just don't run a business. Just be a user possess up to an ounce, the feds aren't going to get you. That's the best that we can do given the federal you know, juggernaut that we're all in. Yep? Do you have any advice for us uh, for how to keep members involved when we're not uh, actively in session counting? For instance, what we, it was brought up in this legislative session, when we had action on what <coughs> call our representatives and check and see how the feedback was, and it would always say that it was great. But the biggest issue that I'm seeing now in Texas as a director is that our members aren't constantly involved. Uh, Right. The que so the question is, what can we do to keep people involved when the legislature is not in session, which as you know is 20 out of every 24 months, give or take, maybe, maybe 19 out of every 24 months. Uh, the answer is that there's a lot of good work that can be done in the off, the off session time. Uh, one is, is that there are a lot of uh, good activists and advocates around the state who live in key districts 
and they can uh, do meetings with their legislators in the district offices rather than going all the way to Austin. Uh, those meetings are something that we would be happy to help coordinate, although I know there are people in the room who already have been doing work in that arena. Uh, so district meetings. Uh, also, uh, there's media coverage that we could generate around the state to keep the debate going that does not re require a bill in the state legislature. Uh, there's also uh, the, uh, the necessity of, of finding people in your district who are supportive. Building an email list of folks in your neighborhood, maybe hang out in the bar and harass people to sign on your email list. And building the list because if a legislator a state house member in uh, Texas, if they were to get 100 phone calls and or emails from constituents who are actually in their district, that would actually be a big deal. I mean, most people don't contact their legislators on any issue at any point in their life. So if a legislator hears from 100 people on the pro-legalization side at some point in the off session, and they don't, of course, they're not gonna hear about anyone lobbying them to keep marijuana illegal, I mean, really. Does anyone really lobby to keep marijuana illegal? You're not gonna really see that. So <clears throat> that helps build the, the momentum so that then by the time that we have bills introduced in Austin in January, that the legislators will be softened up to then take us more seriously when we're lobbying in the halls and testifying before the committees. What other questions do people have? Yep. Yeah, so the question is, since most legislators are Republican in Texas, you know, how do you reach the, uh, the Republican voters who the Republican legislators listen to? Well, the answer is that I think we need credible people to reach out to those voters. Um, people like to listen to folks who are sort of like them. So for instance, if you have a feeling that Republican voters go to Rotary Club meetings and Kiwana clubs and so forth, then uh, maybe it's uh, worth your while, and I would argue it is worth your while, to have uh, speakers from law enforcement against prohibition speaking at those Rotary Clubs, and then of course passing around the sign-up sheet afterwards so that you can get those business leaders in the community, many of whom are gonna be Republican, to join forces with us. Uh, you might wanna think about other advocates who are connected. Uh, there might be someone who is a uh, the head of a Republican club in uh, Lubbock or some other city and ask you know, if you can find a, a leading Republican who's the head of some kind of club, even if it's a college club, but it could be you know, any kind of club. If you can get someone who's supportive, they're gonna be more able to reach out to their kind than someone who is not a Republican or doesn't live in Lubbock. So I think it's about the messenger. Well, the message is kind of easy on this issue. We all know the message, right? Message is, what we're doing for decades isn't working, it's time for a new approach. Another message is uh, we're wasting a lot of money right now on marijuana prohibition. Wouldn't it be better to save money on the enforcement side and generate tax revenue? So right, it's, it's the money argument. And the third argument for legalization is that police have better things to do with their time than sniffing under people's doors for marijuana. And as, um, as a speaker said yesterday, uh, uh, the clearance rates for a lot of crimes in Texas are abysmally low. The one that I focus on when I do TV in Texas is that only 10% uh, of burglaries in Texas result in an arrest. So that means the clearance rate for burglary is 10%. So what that means is that burglary is almost legalized in Texas. And then we have to do better than that, right? For someone who opposes burglary and doesn't want burglary to be legalized, we need to legalize marijuana so the cops could spend time on the burglary side. And of course, also other crimes, car theft, assault, murder, and so forth. The clearance rates are terrible in Texas. And that's because the police are all tied up in knots arresting people for marijuana. 75,000 marijuana arrests per year in Texas alone. It's a criminal justice juggernaut. Uh, so, 
those are the messages that we should all use, whether you're a law enforcement person or a Republican or a medical marijuana advocate or, or anyone. But the messenger also matters. And so if you want to reach out to key Republicans in key districts, try to figure out who the good messenger would be in that community and then co-opt them and really ask them to be your, your spokesperson for the key people that you're trying to reach out to. Looks like we have six more minutes for questions if you have any more. Yep, guy in the hat. question is New Jersey. Uh, it's a state that I'm not so focused on, but uh, I will say, first of all, I don't think that Chris Christie is going to be the Republican presidential candidate. Yeah. So uh, he's, I think, too liberal. <laughs> um, he got a little squishy and a little cut, cuddly with Obama, and I think uh, my Republican friends say that that kind of uh, screwed him in the primary coming up. But, but regardless, the question about New Jersey, uh, you know, I think it's a travesty that it's taken so long for the medical marijuana law to get off the ground, and it's still not even really off the ground. Uh, last I checked, there was one dispensary, maybe it's two now. The most will be six in the state. That's kind of silly if you think about how populous New Jersey is. I mean, we have uh, three in Delaware, and they're going to have six in New Jersey. So that's it's completely disproportionate. So New Jersey's a sad state of affairs. There was too many delays. The, net, the law is too narrow, and the number of dispensaries are too few. However, patients who get into those dispensaries are protected from arrest under state law, so we consider New Jersey to be a medical marijuana state, even though, of course, it's not as good as the rest. What, what other questions do people have, if any? All right, I went under time, Sean, wherever you are. <laughs> four and a half minutes under. Thanks for your time and attention, and I hope to spend some more time with you later.